Good morning, everyone. Can I give you all a really warm welcome to our morning worship service today at Fisherwick Church on the day following the coronation of King Charles, which for many of us, I'm sure, has been a once-in-a-lifetime event. Whether you're joining us here in the church building in South Belfast or over the radio, or maybe even watching us on the live stream, we're so glad to have you joining us this morning. We're delighted to have the opportunity to share the joy we have in knowing Jesus and worshiping together as a community of faith and hope. So welcome in the name of Jesus. May each one of us encounter the love of God this morning, and may we find spiritual nourishment as we worship together. The psalmist declares, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Let's worship God together as we sing our opening hymn. I will sing the wondrous story. Let's turn our hearts to God in prayer. 
Father God, this morning we want to throw wide the doors of this church and the doors of our hearts and invite you in. We realize that you don't need our invitation. You're here anyway, but living God, we want to recognize your sovereignty afresh this morning. We want to recognize that you and you alone are God and that you deserve the very highest praise of our hearts. So we thank you this morning for the incredible gift of your grace, for how you delight to forgive all who turn to you in repentance. We thank you that through your Son we may experience your forgiveness, your freedom, your peace. So we humbly confess our sins this morning and ask for your mercy. Cleanse us from the mess of our mistakes. Create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. We ask that you would restore to us the joy of our salvation. That you would sustain us by the power of your Holy Spirit and lead us deeper into a knowledge of you today. Father, break us out of tired apathy, of mechanical routines, and take us into a deeper relationship with you. Give us hearts that burn for you and a hunger that seeks you out. Give us minds that prioritize you over everything inferior in our lives. Fill us afresh with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Diane McKelvey is going to read to us now from the Word of God. Our reading is from Luke chapter 15. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's anthem was commissioned for Fisherwick Church Choir in 2022 by a member of our congregation. The familiar words of the hymn, I heard the voice of Jesus say by Horatio Bonner, are set to music by Philip Stopford. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest.
Cindy Brown is going to lead us in our prayers of intercession. Shall we pray together? Most merciful Father, we are happy to come together today to join with so many around the world who call themselves by the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for seeing us individually and calling us by name to belong, to belong to a family bigger than we can imagine and to a father kinder than any human parent. And it's your kindness that invites us now to pray for others. We pray for the king and queen that you will direct and bless them as they carry out their duties and that they may be a source of inspiration to many and so promote your glory. We remember those in our communities who feel lost like the lost sheep in Luke's parable. Have mercy, Lord, on those who feel lost to society with problems too big to face alone, like addiction and homelessness, unemployment and poverty. It is hard to make a good life with such relentless burdens, Lord. For groups like the Samaritans, the Welcome Organization and our food banks, we pray for people and resources to keep these life-saving services running. Prompt us even now to give of our time or money, however little or much we can. Father, even if we ourselves don't experience lostness, we daily hear about refugees who are far away from security of home. We pray for local initiatives across our island that create safety for immigrants of all kinds. May your spirit fuel their vision to create the radical belonging of your kingdom for all without discrimination and where we can show us how to be a warm embrace of welcome. We name in our hearts loved ones and our families who feel lost to us personally, whether through estrangement or life-defining ill health or through a mental illness that makes us unknown to them. Good Shepherd Jesus, hear our sadness for each person named in our hearts break into their situation by your spirit. Speak their name as only you can, in such a way they will know your comfort. And as we can, use us to show your love, peace, and hope. It's in your name we pray, amen. One of the blessings of congregational life here at Fisherwick is the rich and varied diet of worship styles we enjoy, which encompasses the best of both choral and contemporary praise. Michael Ferguson, our youth associate, and his fiance Izzy are going to lead us in two songs now, accompanied by our director of worship, Neil Agnew. Trust in you alone, and I will 
has been something going on in our country this weekend that has been inescapable, hasn't there? Of course, I'm talking about the coronation of King Charles. I wonder if you tuned in to see the coronation service on television yesterday afternoon. We watched it at home with great interest and found it an amazing spectacle. Did you notice there were so many deeply symbolic objects that played a vital role in the service? There was the royal orb, the sovereign scepter, the coronation chair, the stone of scone, the royal ring on the king's finger, St. Edward's crown. But there was one type of ceremonial object that I was looking out for yesterday, and I was surprised it didn't feature. I'm talking about the crozier, the shepherd's crook that you often see the Archbishop of Canterbury carrying during important church services. I always love to see this humble tool of a shepherd now synonymous with the function of a bishop with one who shepherds the flock of God. And I couldn't help feeling that along with all the items that were presented to King Charles, a shepherd's crook would have been appropriate for the king because there's a connection to be made between the role of our newly crowned monarch and that of a shepherd. A shepherd's concern is to lead his flock in the abundant life. He wants to see his flock flourish and thrive. And in the same way, King Charles wants to lead his people in a way that leads to their flourishing. And when you think about it, King Charles has str some strong shepherding credentials. Just think for a moment of how he's had a lifelong passion for ecology sustainability, conservation, and architecture. Think about how he has built up the Prince's Trust to be a vehicle for transforming the lives of young people across the nation, even across the Commonwealth. With his new role as the Supreme Governor of the Church of England, King Charles has a holistic interest in the flourishing of his people, a flourishing that is more than just material, 
a flourishing that encompasses both body, mind, and spirit. So I suggest there's clearly a shepherding dimension to his rule. In our reading this morning, we read of a shepherd's relentless pursuit of a single lost sheep. And it's a powerful illustration of God's caring love for lost individuals. We can learn so much from this incredible parable. We can glean truth to apply to our own lives. But I doubt if we'll learn any modern business principles from the action of this shepherd. From a cold-hearted business point of view, this parable doesn't make any sense. This shepherd has lost just 1% of his flock, but yet he leaves the 99% of his flock in the safety of the open country, and he single-mindedly pursues this lost sheep up into the hill country amid the rocks and boulders. This shepherd goes to extraordinary efforts and endures personal inconvenience, not to mention the fatigue and the distress, to reclaim just 1% of his profit margin. I wonder would any of the dragons on the dragon's den approve of this shepherd's business practices? Somehow, I don't think so. I think they would write off that lost sheep as a tax-deductible operational loss. I think they'd move on with business and forget about it. But Jesus didn't tell us this parable to teach us profitable business practices. He told us this story to teach us an amazing insight into the character of God. Jesus is teaching us about the shepherd heart of God. This good shepherd doesn't think that that lost sheep is a write-off. He knows his sheep. He cares deeply for their welfare. He loves each one. And springing from that deep love is the shepherd's relentless determination to seek out that lost sheep and to rescue it. He can't just leave it vulnerable and defenseless in the wild country. And what a joy when the shepherd finds his lost sheep. Even though his he's tired and even though his feet must be aching from the climb. Verse 5 tells us when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And I imagine him singing in celebration all the way home. And did you notice how when the shepherd arrives home, the, the, the joyful celebration is contagious. The shepherd doesn't just keep it to himself. It spreads to his family, to his community, to his neighborhood. It spills over and impacts his friends and neighbors. I can imagine the, the good news spreading through the village. Come and join the celebration. The sheep that was hopelessly lost has been found, and now we're all going to have a party. Then right at the end of the parable, like the plot twist at the end of a movie, Jesus delivers a big surprise. You see, this little parable isn't just some pleasant story designed to warm our hearts. Jesus is the ultimate communicator, and from his mouth, this parable becomes a vehicle for communicating profound truth about God, as well as profound truth about humanity. To understand this plot twist, we need to remind ourselves about the context of when Jesus told this story. If we had been standing listening to Jesus when he first told this parable, you could have cut the atmosphere with a knife. There were two very different groups of people listening to Jesus. On one side, there were a group of deeply religious folk, and they were all tutting in disapproval. You're going to have to use your imagination here. It's probably really difficult to imagine a group of religious people tutting. But they were, and sometimes they still do. They were tutting because they didn't appreciate the kind of low lives that Jesus was hanging around with. And then standing cheek by jowl with these tutting religious folk is this ragged group of misfits that any self-respecting religious person would want to avoid at all costs. The message has a nice turn of phrase when it calls these people men and women of doubtful reputation. But I think the New Living Translation captures the scandalous nature of these individuals. It calls them notorious sinners. These are people who are not very religious. 
their professions, their lifestyles makes them detestable to good religious folk. But yet they're drawn to Jesus. They're drawn to his teaching. Maybe they'd grown accustomed to the mess of their lives. But somehow listening to Jesus has triggered a longing for change. Could it be that, that they could change? Could it be that their life could be different? Could it be that they could break free from the vortex of sin and shame that had led them to become notorious for all the wrong reasons? So it's into this polarized situation that Jesus delivers the shocking plot twist. When he says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 religious people who do not need to repent. Jesus is making an important connection here. First of all, Jesus makes the connection between the good shepherd and God. I think it's tragic how many people have a flawed image of who God is. Many people imagine God to be no better than that group of tutting legalists. They imagine he's up in heaven tutting at their every imperfection like an irritable headmaster waiting to punish them. But Jesus is telling us that God is like the good shepherd who goes to great lengths to rescue that lost sheep and to bring it home at great personal cost. And he rejoices all the way home when that lost sheep is found. Easter reminds us that it's at the cross that we see the extraordinary extent of God's shepherd-hearted love. Our good shepherd came to rescue us and it cost him everything. But here's the amazing thing. God loves each of us so deeply, no matter how far we have strayed from the fold, that there's great celebration in heaven when even one lost soul repents. And this brings us to the second big connection that Jesus makes. People are like lost sheep. Some may be offended by this parable. It cuts against the grain of our sense of self-importance, of our sense of pride in who we are. Maybe you might even bristle at this com comparison. It's not very flattering. How exactly are we like sheep? Sheep are docile, defenseless creatures who are very vulnerable out in the wild. They're at the mercy of the elements. They're at the mercy of the terrain. They're at the mercy of predators. When they get into scrapes, they can't defend themselves. They need to be rescued. And they need continual husbandry to take things out of their fleeces, to pair their hooves, to bind up any wounds, to shear their fleeces. And of course, sheep are blissfully unaware of how high maintenance they are. They need constant supervision because they have a habit of wandering off and getting lost and isolated. What Jesus is saying resonates with the words of the prophet Isaiah, who said, all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus says we are like sheep. We're continually getting into scrapes. We're, we're, we're continually losing our way. We don't like to admit to being vulnerable, but we often find ourselves at the mercy of situations beyond our control. We're easily hurt. We carry wounds from the past. We think we're, we know where we're going. We think we've got it all figured out. But the truth is that when we trust in our own sense of direction in our lives, we can end up feeling lost. And isolated. The truth is that we need a good shepherd. We need a savior who will seek us out, who will rescue us, who will restore us. And that's where Jesus comes in. Being a good shepherd is part of his job description. Listen to these words from John 10. The thief approaches with malicious intent, looking to steal, slaughter, and destroy. I came to give life with joy and abundance. As a church of Jesus Christ, we are a group of people who have been released from the mess of our past to live life with joy and abundance. That's the life Jesus called us to. We're not called to be religious tutters. We're called to live life to the full for Jesus. I am the good shepherd, he says. 
The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, sheep in his care. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. The good news this morning is that you and I don't have to be anxious and isolated anymore. We, we don't have to put up with any feelings of being lost and helpless. You and I are invited into the shepherd's embrace. God wants to rescue us. He wants to bring us into the security of his flock. He wants us to step into the abundant joy of his presence. Let me leave you with the 23rd Psalm, which is just dripping in the imagery of the shepherd heart of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Hear the call of the good shepherd this morning and respond to his shepherd-hearted love. Amen. We're going to close with our, 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 our closing praise. Will you come and follow me? And now may the God of peace, who brought the great shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus, back from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with every good thing for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.
Thank you, everyone. We can all breathe a sigh of relief now. <laughs> right, uh, can I just uh, highlight some announcements before we, 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 with tea and coffee at the back? And I think there's even some nice buns down there this morning. Uh, Christian Aid Week will be next week. So, so next week's going to be a, a dual purpose. We're going to have uh, Michael's, Michael's commissioning service. And then after that, there'll be all the buns and stuff that you can buy uh, in support of Christian Aid. Uh, is Peter Lindsay here? Peter, is there anything you want to add? Come on up so people can hear you. Yes, Bert. 